the definition of a point of inflection. So if we're given a function f that is continuous, oops, sorry about that, uh, the f is continuous on some open interval containing c, then we say that the graph of f, if, sorry, if the graph of f has a tangent line at the point c, f of c, and the concavity of f changes, so the concavity f of, of f changes at this point, we call that point a point of inflection. So this part is important, um, has a tangent line at the point. So basically, in order for a point of inflection to exist, the function has to be defined, the original function has to be defined at that point um, in order for our point to be a point of inflection. Um, also, there has to be a tangent line, so you can't have something like a sharp point. Um, you could have a vertical tangent line, so the tangent line could still be, um, the derivative could still be undefined there, but if you have a vertical tangent line, that tangent line exists, uh, and it could still represent a point of inflection, but you can't have like a hole in your graph or a discontinuity, or you can't have like a sharp point because then your tangent line does not exist at that point. Okay. So in example three, we want to determine the points of inflection and then discuss the concavity of our graph. So again, when we're looking at the points of inflection, we want to, first of all, uh, show that there's a tangent line, but more importantly, we have to see that the concavity changes at that point. So we're going to be testing the concavity for the function, which means we have to look at the second derivative and then determine if, um, the function exists there so that we have a point of inflection. Okay, so first derivative is f prime. Uh, so six and two is that's 12 x to the fifth uh, plus 15 x to the fourth. That's my first derivative. To test concavity, I need to look at the second derivative. So I'll find the second derivative. We are going to get 12 times five is 60. So 60 x to the fourth plus uh, 15 and four is again 60 x to the third. So we wanna know where is this zero? Uh, I'm gonna factor out a 60 x cubed because that's what they have in common and I'm gonna be left with an x plus one. So this is my second derivative. So where is this equal to zero? So this is equal to zero when 60 x cubed is equal to zero or when x plus one is equal to zero. And that happens at x equaling 0 and x equaling negative 1. Uh, so we want to go ahead and test our intervals. So it's going to go from negative infinity to negative 1. Uh, I know that this function is continuous everywhere. Uh, it's just a normal polynomial function. So it is defined everywhere and continuous everywhere. And then from negative 1 to 0 and then from zero to infinity. Okay, so pick some values, negative two, uh, negative half, positive one. So plugging into the second derivative, so we're plugging into this. If I plug a negative number in here, that's going to give me, let me move this really quickly. Move this over here. Um, if I plug a negative number into this, when you cube it, it's gonna stay negative. Uh, plugging negative 2 in there is going to make this negative. A negative times a negative is positive. Plugging in negative 1 half again is going to make that negative. Um, negative 1 half plus 1 is going to be a positive number. So this will be, sorry, uh, negative because a negative times a positive is negative. Plugging in a positive number here is going to make that positive, And then a positive number there is going to make that positive, which is positive. So that means that this function is concave up. Um, the function f is concave up on this interval. It is concave down on this interval. And it's concave up on the interval from 0 to infinity. So where do we have inflection points? So remember, an inflection point happens when there's a change in concavity and when our function, if our function has a tangent line there. Uh, since this function is differentiable everywhere, there will be tangent lines at every point on the uh, entire interval from negative infinity to infinity. So the tangent lines do exist. So we have a change of concavity at x equals negative one. 
So that tells me I'm going to have an inflection point uh, when x is equal to negative 1. Let's actually find the point. Plug it in. Uh, negative 1. So negative 1 to the 6th is positive 1 times 2. That's 2. And then negative 1 to the 5th is negative 1 times 3 is that. So I get negative 1, negative 1 is going to be my inflection point. Um, and then I also have an inflection point at 0 when x is 0. So plugging in 0, I'm going to get 0. So 0, 0, and negative 1, negative 1 are my inflection points. Uh, and then again, my function is concave up on the interval from negative infinity to 1 and from 0 to infinity. And it is concave down from negative 1 to 0. So another thing that we can use when looking at the second derivative is something called the second derivative test for local extrema. So this helps us, just like the first derivative test, this helps us determine local extrema, relative maxes and mins, um, but this time using the second derivative. So this is beneficial if, let's say, you were just given the first derivative, you weren't told information about the original function f, but you needed to figure out where the original function had a relative maximum or minimum, then you could use the second derivative test um, that we have here. So this says if the first derivative is equal to zero, so in both of these cases, if the first derivative is equal to zero at some point c, and the, the second derivative is negative, right? so that means it's concave down, then the function has a local maximum. And that kind of makes sense, right? So you have a concave down function. The first derivative is 0. Then that means that that point would be a local maximum. Um, the second part of this says if the first derivative is equal to 0 and the second derivative is positive, so it's concave up, then f has a local maximum at that value. So again, concave up, first derivative is equal to 0. Uh, so again, that point there would be a local maximum. So pretty intuitive as far as if you kind of break down what these things mean. Um, so second, if the second derivative is negative, at some point where the first derivative is equal to zero, we have a local maximum. Uh, if we know the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive, then we have a local minimum. So let's go ahead and use the second derivatives test to find some local extrema. So before we could do that, we need to find the first and second derivative. So f prime of x equals, take the derivative, we get 3x squared minus 6. And we know that in order for us to use the second derivative test, we need to know where the first derivative is equal to 0. So where is this equal to 0? So I can add 6. I'm going to get 3x squared equals 6. Uh, divide by 3, we get that x squared equals 2. And so this is going to be at x equals plus or minus the square root of 2. So we're going to be looking at um, the second derivative's value at the square root of 2. We want to know if it's positive or negative there. OK, so my critical points are at x equals, the critical points are at x equals negative square root of 2 and x equals positive square root of 2. We're not looking at intervals. We're just looking at critical points for our function here. And now what is the second derivative? So take the derivative of this. We're going to get uh, 6x minus 0. So this is my second derivative. So at the first critical point, at the first critical point, f double prime of negative rad 2, is this going to be positive or negative? Uh, that's going to be 6 times negative rad 2. I actually don't care about its value. I just care about its sign. So it's negative there. Uh, the second derivative at positive rad 2 is 6 times a positive rad 2, which is something positive. So this tells me that um, at x equals negative rad 2, my function f is concave down, right? It's concave down. And so with it being concave down, that tells me that at x equals negative rad 2, we have a, a local maximum. And in this portion here, when x is equal to positive rad 2, the second derivative is positive, which means we have concave up. And so this would be a local 
minimum. So we have um, local max at x equals negative square root of 2. And then we have a local min at x equals positive square root of 2. And if you wanted to figure out the, uh, the point, you could just take these and plug them back into f. Now, a lot of times we aren't going to have the original function f. We might just be given the first derivative, uh, which is why you would use the second derivative test rather than the first derivative test. Um, but And so we wouldn't actually be able to find the, the coordinates of the maximum and minimum. But in this case, you could if you wanted, you could plug them back in. So for this problem, we are given the graph of, or the equation of f prime, f prime of x equals 4x cubed minus 12x squared, and we're asked to identify where extrema occur. So there's a couple ways we could do this. We can use the first derivative and try and find the extrema using where the first derivative is equal to zero, or we could use the second derivative test. Um, I'm gonna probably just use the first derivative since it's already there and I just want to know where that equals zero. Okay, so part A, we want to know where 4x cubed minus 12x squared equals zero. Uh, if we were to factor this, it would be, we could factor out a 4x squared in this, and we would get x minus three. So we could set that equal to zero. And this happens, so we set each piece equal to zero. Um, And so this happens when x equals 0 and when x is equal to 3. So those are the two places that we're going to have uh, extrema. We don't know what kind of extrema they're going to be just yet because we haven't done the first derivative test. But we can do the first derivative test right now because it's asking us where f, our function f, is increasing and decreasing. And we can figure that out by looking at uh, the signs of f prime. So let's go ahead and do that in part b. So we weren't given the intervals, but we can kind of make them, right? And we weren't given the, sorry, the table, so we could just make it. So it goes from negative infinity to zero, um, from zero to three, and then from three to infinity. Um, I know that my uh, function that I got my derivative from is going to be differentiable because my result is a polynomial, which means its derivative came from something of one degree higher, um, so it's going to be differentiable. Um, okay, so if I were to pick a number, let's say negative one, one, four, plug them into our derivative. So negative one in here, that's gonna be positive and then a negative. So a positive times a negative is negative. Plugging one in, we get a positive and a negative. Um, which is again negative, and then plugging in uh, four here, we get a positive and a positive, so we get a positive. So these actually don't uh, tell me, so actually both of these are not extrema. So you can see that there's no sign change at zero, so this is not actually an extrema. It's a critical number, but not an extrema. So f prime does not change signs, so we don't actually have um, an extrema there, but we have a change in our derivative at this point here, goes from negative to positive. So that tells us we have a relative um, minimum at x equals three. We don't know the y coordinate because we don't know the original function, but we know we have a relative minimum at x equals three. Uh, our function is going to be decreasing so our function f um, is going to be decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to three, right? Because there's no change in sign that tells us that it's actually just staying decreasing there. Um, and it's going to be increasing on the interval from three to infinity. All right, inflection points. So that means we have to look at the second derivative, figure out where the second derivative is going to be changing signs. Um, so what is the second derivative? So let's go ahead and take the derivative here. That's gonna give me 12x squared minus 24x. Um, I can factor this, factor out a 12x. So I get 12x and x minus two. 
uh, because I want to know where this is equal to zero so that I can do the uh, test for concavity. So it's going to equal zero when x is equal to zero and when x is equal to two. So again, we can set up our intervals. So from negative infinity to zero, from zero to two, and from two to infinity. So we can test points. Let's go like negative one, one, three. So we're plugging into the second derivative here. So a negative plugged in this is gonna make that negative and a negative. So negative times a negative is positive. Um, plugging one in, that's a positive times a negative is negative. Plugging three in, that's a positive times a positive, which is positive. So we have a change in concavity uh, at x equals zero and at x equals two. So x equals zero and two, those represent inflection points. Inflection points. So we have inflection points at x equals zero and at x equals two. Uh, so my function is going to be concave up, concave up from negative infinity to zero, and then from two to infinity, right where the second derivative is positive, and then it's concave down in between that from zero to two. All right, so using all of this information, we want to try and sketch a graph of our curve. Um, okay, so we know we have a relative minimum at x equals three. So let's say here's three, we have a relative minimum here. Um, so we're gonna have something, let's make it down here. We're gonna have some relative minimum here my function is going to be decreasing on the entire interval. So as I'm coming in here, it's going to be decreasing on that entire interval from negative infinity up to my relative minimum. And then it's going to increase after that. Uh, but we have inflection points at zero and two. So on the interval from negative infinity to zero, so up to this, so like up to somewhere on the, uh, y-axis, my function is going to be concave up. It's going to look something like this. So let's just give it like a point here, concave up. So concave up, and it is also decreasing. So it's going to be something like this, decreasing and concave up like this, maybe. Um, and then at two, from zero to two, from zero to two, it's concave down. It's concave down, so let's like put a point here. So maybe it looks something like, like this on that interval, it's concave down. So it still decreases, right? That's still decreasing, but that's concave down. And then from two to three, two to three, it's still decreasing, but from two to three, it's concave up. Actually, from two to infinity, it's concave up. So it's gonna look something like a parabola after that. Um, but it's decreasing up to the point three here. So it like, decreases like that. So it's decreasing, but concave up there. It's decreasing, but concave down there from zero to two. And then from two to three, it's decreasing, but concave up. And then from three to infinity, we can see that it's increasing uh, and it's also going to be concave up because it's concave up from two to infinity. So it's increasing at that point, which means we have our relative minimum there and it's going to turn and do something like this. So we have something like this. Uh, now this isn't the only graph that would meet this requirement, right? This, we don't know exactly where that minimum value could be. It could be up here for all we know. Um, this whole graph could be shifted up, it could be shifted down. It can't be shifted left and right because we know that these are where these points, the inflection points and the minimum should occur at those x values. But it can basically be shifted up or down, could be stretched, kind of compressed. It just has to kind of follow this general shape.